Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist. Uh, I'm here today uh, with uh, Muhammad. That is the 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 main Muhammad. Akhi <laughs> uh, Muhammad, uh, not uh, around today. And uh, instead, I've got you know a very very good alternative. Uh, Muhammad Arshad, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalam I hope I hope I'm a good alternative, inshallah. So Muhammad's already been on the podcast. Uh, must have been episode 40 something a while ago right and mm. um we kind of talked about hmm what did we talk about bro it was like i think we talked about general uh, your journey personal actually, development. we yeah. talked about personal development but also talked about volunteering and your mm. your journey um for those that don't know uh muhammad is my business partner in muslim ceo and we've been working together for probably five years at this point you know pu- putting all everything together probably mm. about four or five years right um so and i think it's interesting kind of relationship because uh i don't know if we would have ever have met each other if it wasn't for do, the you know, business stuff but we should mm. have met each other you know if you know what i mean um uh, but alhamdulillah it's, it's really good that, that we got to know each other and uh, we work with each other every day alhamdulillah and uh yeah today so today i thought you know Faisal came on not too long ago, um, our other, you know, our partner in Muslim CEO, um, he came on, must have been in Ramadan around that time, right? So I thought, you know, let's get Muhammad on again, because really, this is a really good topic, you know, of confidence. Um, it's a big one, Wallah, it's a big one. Um, mm. And so I just, because I know you've been dissecting your thoughts on this topic recently. So that's the best time yeah. to talk about it, really. So to, to just open up the conversation, I had a bit of a, not a game, but a little of a, um, icebreaker, if you like, right? So, you know, on Mind House, Muhammad, you're going to have to, you're just going to have to be very transparent, yeah? Mm. I know you're generally transparent, but you have to be even more transparent, okay? So, uh, first, what I want you to do, bro, is rate, I'm going to give you some names, and you got to rate these people's confidence out of 10. Right? Oh, publicly, yeah? Now, wait, yeah? <laughs> this is before you coach them. Because right? mm-hmm. I know you coach a lot of people when it comes to public speaking. And so uh, uh, the way I see it, bro, anyway, I don't think this is uh, something that might hurt anyone's feelings because confidence is not a uh, measure of someone's ability, someone's value, someone's worth. It's just something that is or isn't, right? Oh, he's good at football. He's not good. That's how I see it anyway. So I'll give you th- a few names. And I was struggling because I don't remember exactly who you kind of uh, coached on, on, on public speaking stuff. But... I remember you you did coach Muhammad Hijab. So what would you say his confidence was out of 10? 10 being like super confident. Yeah, I think Muhammad Hijab is definitely around the nine region. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Abdurrahim McCarthy? I think it's probably around a seven. Okay. Or a six. Okay. And uh, that's surprising. And Mikhail Smith? Hmm. Okay, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I think probably around a seven or eight. Really, mashallah. Okay, yeah. good. Now, give me a wild card one because I don't remember everyone you've coached. So, um, Hamza. So, Hamza was very, very high. Again, Hamza Zortz is that is. He, mm-hmm. I would say he was like a, a, a nine okay. uh, or eight. Okay. Know. Okay, cool. Um, now, I want to do another quick one, which is I want you to give, again, out of 10, confidence of these people like, like now or in general, as you know them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Abdurrahim Green. Hmm. Yeah, I think he's definitely nine, nine, eight, nine. Okay. Uh, Hamza, you'd still give the nine, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So before you coached him, he was nine, after he's nine. Yeah. 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 With a lot of these guys, what, you, what you'll find is that most of these guys, they were actually uh, confident. Okay. okay. Um, and so what happens is that you need to understand that confidence fundamentally is about trust. Okay. How mm-hmm. much trust do you have in your own abilities, in your own qualities, in your own self-worth? Right. right. Mm-hmm. And so you have this confidence uh, about yourself. Now, mm-hmm. what you'll find is once your confidence is at the right levels, that will then enable you to go and take action. And a lot of action mm-hmm. is either physically doing things or it will be communicating effectively. Mm-hmm. So with a lot of these guys, what you'll find is that they were actually most of these guys mm-hmm. were amazing speakers who were mm-hmm. confident before I trained them or coached them in any way. Right? Mm-hmm. They were confident. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, what I did is I basically helped the expert speakers to increase their effective speaking right. because 
uh, once you have the right level of confidence, then you're actually able to go out and give dawah and speak. But yeah. what happened with a lot of speakers is they fail uh, to realize what speaking is about. So mm -hmm. most people will see speaking about uh, communication of information. Right? Mm -hmm. And what I did with a lot of these guys is that I made them realize and have a paradigm shift that speaking is not just about uh, communication of information, but it's actually about influence. And this is the reason why a nobody like me was training some of the great speakers because I understood influence to a level where they didn't really understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and so confidence is like the foundation of that because before yes. you can get to the part where your voice actually comes out, you need to have that level of confidence where you're willing to kind of speak up. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah <clears throat> we need to dive into that for sure as well. Mm. Um, last guy I had here was uh, Muhammad Sharif. Out of 10, confidence. Yeah, so Muhammad Sharif, definitely. I'd say he was a 9, 10. Okay. See, I don't like giving anyone a 10 because yeah. I think like they're so uh, big, you know, 10 is a big number. But yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what about yourself? Uh, I would say I'm probably confidence wise. I'm, it depends on the things. So, for example, if you give yeah. me like a, a business. Also, oh, now when it comes to you, you get nuanced, yeah? Yeah, because, <laughs> because I look at it as a human being, isn't it? I look at myself. Um, yeah. I think uh, I can put on the confidence. Like, it depends on the situation. Um, a lot of the time, uh, I sit around the seven mark, I'd say. Um, really? Yeah, I do. I sit at like the seven. Because for me, this is the other thing I think we need to realize about confidence is that mm. um, a lot of the time, what happens with people is they let fear paralyze them. Um, and so what happens is because of the way they feel, they don't go ahead and do what's needed to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes I might not feel the right way about things. So for example, if I'm about to record a module like I was doing earlier on, I might not feel as confident as I'd like to because maybe I'm not as prepared. So mm -hmm. I might give myself a six or a five, right? Because I don't really feel prepared. But then when I get into it, I feel like my confidence kind of increases and, and it gets better with, with time and stuff. So yeah. yeah, normally I'd say that. I think if people see me, because this is another thing, right? Because, you know, when you're asking me about these names, because I know them so well, I know their doubts. Like yeah. what, what Abdurrahim actually has a self-doubt about, I can mm -hmm. tell you. I'm not mm -hmm. going to, right? <laughs> same, <laughs> yeah. with Hamza, same with Hamza, right? So but you still give Hamza, them nine, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I know what their doubts are and I know like uh, what part they play and how big a part they play on them. Mm. But at the same time, I know when someone outside is looking at them, they would perceive themselves as quite confident. So if someone mm. looked at me, they would say I'm nine, I'm 10, I'm eight, like that yeah. kind of region anyway. Yes, you know? yeah. So I think I would, uh, I would say you're a, an eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you uh, do the public speaking training with Abu Osama as well? He was supposed to be at my training. So he was mm. supposed to be there, but um, he was in the same one when I trained, uh, I think it was Abdurrahim uh, McCarthy, Sheikh Abdurrahim. Um, he was supposed to be as part of that. Right. And then okay. he wasn't there. And that was quite interesting. Because oh yeah, right. I, you told me I, 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 had, I had doubts about yeah. teaching him confidence, right? Because <laughs> Abu Osama was like so confident, mashallah, right? And so I'm thinking in my head, like, and, and this is what happens with some of the guys I had a relationship before. So it's quite easy mm. to train them, right? Yeah, yeah. But someone like Sheikh Abdurrahim McCarthy or, or Muhammad Hijab, these are guys who I've looked up to and I've seen, and then I'm there standing in front of them to try and uh, take mm. their communication confidence up. And this mm. is what I'm saying, that it requires a different level of confidence for me as well mm. to be able to stand there. But for me, a lot of, it, a lot of my confidence, I, I think, uh, comes from a slightly different way to how confidence is taught. Uh, yeah. And so in the general sense, I think uh, confidence is a lot about... Uh, what I call ego confidence, right? Yes. Um, and, and I feel that for me, I have a real focus on, uh, on like the value I can bring. And this is the kind of what I call the believer's confidence. Yeah. And so what that does is all my own fears and my doubts, they are overpowered by what I call believer's confidence, you know? Mm. So I think that really helps in these kind of situations. Yeah, okay. Yeah. A believer's confidence TM, yeah? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, excellent. Yeah. Okay, so you know, with confidence, I think, yeah, and it's a topic that everyone talks about, right? In mm. terms of between themselves, whether you're a 15 year old or you're a you know 51 year old, everyone mm. is talking about. Oh, I'm not that confident. He's not confident. And why? What the sense I get is that when we use it day to day, we're basically talking about how loud or how uh, dominant or how uh, you know extroverted a person is. But like, what is the, you know, according to you, what's like the legit definition of confidence? So like I said, for me, confidence is uh, basically, first of all, I need to say that confidence is not something that you have or you don't have. Um, it's actually a feeling. 
And it's a feeling to do with, like I said, trust in your own abilities and your own qualities and your own worth. Right. Mm. So fundamentally it's a feeling. And I think that a lot of the times once this is part of the, the training and work that I do with people is, you know, once they realize that it's actually a feeling rather than a concrete, tangible mm. thing that I have to have or mm. get or I don't have, they start to realize what's possible, right? Mm. So, for example, every one of us as human beings, no matter what situation we've been in in our lives, there has been a moment or a second in your life where you did feel a little bit more confident than you do right now, for example, yeah. right? Mm. It might be the day you passed your driving test. It might be the day you graduated. It might be the day you got married. But sometime in your life, your confidence has been slightly higher than it is now, right? And so if you can try and transport yourself back to that, and that's what I do with, with people, is like try and transport them back to that moment where they realize, hold on, my confidence is actually a bit higher than it is now. Mm. And so if I can get it a little bit higher, then that means I can get it a little bit higher and a little bit mm. higher. And then suddenly, like, it, you know, the world's your oyster. Mm. Mm. And, and so it's like very much a context dependent, right? Um, yeah. So, wow, I, I, I don't think you ever said that to me. I never thought of it like that, that it's, a, it's just a feeling. I, yeah. I, I had it in my mind as it is your perception of your ability. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you're saying it is, well, perception, feeling, it's similar thing, right? But yeah. You're saying it's it's often it's context based, right? So to, for me, like to say I'm I'm gonna drink this whole cup of water, I'm very confident in that. But now when you say you know uh, you know cl jump out this window, climb up to the roof, you know now not so much, right? So it's very much uh, context dependent, right? Yeah, yeah, it's context dependent, and and also there is an element, by the way, that confidence uh, comes through competence as well. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not just a case of that. Um, just I just feel confident. It's the fact that if you do something again and again and again, you become more competent and that increases your confidence. So like I always say, if I said to you, I mean, you have to go from your house where you are right now yeah. uh, in that room to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. right? How confident are you that you know the way there? You'll be very confident, just like anyone else. Why? Yes. Because you've done it a million times. Mm, I'm right? competent at it. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, you're so competent. That maybe even if I told you you have to put a blindfold, you could still make it down to your kitchen. Yeah. Right. But the point is, if you've never ever done it, or you've got something in front of you that you've never mm. ever done before, uh -huh. then suddenly, because of that lack of uh, competence, you start to feel low in confidence. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's about really pushing your competence level up quickly. Yeah. And the great thing about learning and competence is that it's, it's that kind of thing where it's like at the start, your, your curve for learning is huge. Yes. Right. And then after a while it plateaus. Yeah. So you can actually get your confidence up for something very, very quickly mm -hmm. just by engaging in some level of competence. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the reason why I'm able to come and speak to you here about confidence today is because I've taught it so much. But if I'd never, ever taught it and never, ever thought about it or mm -hmm. gone into it in any detail and then you said, let's speak about it, I'll be like, oh, feeling a bit, a bit shaky because you know, it's not something we've discussed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think like definitely we need to have this uh, mindset that it's a mix between uh, a feeling and, and you being able to control your state. Because again, this is a lot of what I do uh, with Sister Fatima Barakatullah before she went on national TV for the niqab debate. Uh, we worked completely on her mindset. Mm -hmm. How are you going to actually uh, hold uh, your, your composure when everything around you is going crazy, how are you going to do it so that you can actually handle the questions that are flying in at you? And how are you going to control your actual state, your way of thinking, your way of being in those high pressured moments? Because most of the time when we're dealing with uh, competence in terms of speaking, it comes from being in these moments which are hard to speak in. Right. So for, for example, like me and you, we're, we're quite comfortable, alhamdulillah, like speaking on, on a platform like this. But most of mankind, if you said to them, right, I'm going to put a camera in your face and you're going to go online and speak about something now, mm. they would be terrified. Uh, and a lot of that is not because they don't have the speaking capability. And this, this is the difference, right? So most of the people that I, I coach, every one of them can speak perfectly. So what I will do with, with people who are on my program is I will speak to them one-to-one, -one, for example, first. I mean, how are you doing? You okay? This, that. Have that conversation with them. And then later I will reference that when we spoke earlier, you spoke perfectly to me. So why is it now that there's 10 people looking at you, suddenly everything's changed for you? So it's and not the only an ability thing. thing. Mm. Yeah, it's not an ability thing, right? It's mm. actually all going on in the mind. Yes. Right? And, and this mm. is why I love like Mind Heist and the, the idea behind it, because a lot of the time what happens is that the Mind Heist is actually of your doubts and your fears and your anxieties taking over the mind and basically reducing your capability of basic things like speaking.
-hmm. And the mm -hmm. thing that will alter that is actually the level of confidence. So as the confidence uh, increases, then your abilities kind of come back to you. It's a bit like kryptonite, like your doubts basically stop you from your basic powers. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a combination of competence in the thing and yep. you, you know, I guess being aware of your competence, those two things. Yes, it's, it's you being aware, but also I'm saying to you that it's about mm. controlling your state, right? Like realizing that mm. your state, the way you are perceiving the situation mm. uh, will affect it. So yeah. for example, uh, there's a book called The Three Laws of Performance. And they say um, the first law of performance is that your performance is based upon how things are occurring to you. Yes. Okay. So uh, Not how what things that are occurring, how things are occurring to you. To you. Yeah. yeah. So for example, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Sometimes we're on conference calls, right? And we're on a conference call and no cameras on. And what are you doing during a conference call? You're on your phone, you're on Facebook, you're, you know, you're, why, why are you like that? Why? Because in your mind you're thinking, oh, these guys are always talking on a conference call. I never say anything anyway. They never ask me anything. It's irrelevant. Okay. <laughs> so my level of performance on that conference call is so low. Yeah. Right. Just imagine if we're talking about finance or ads, right. And it's like really, really low where, yeah. you know, he's not interested in it. So he won't pay attention. Okay. But, if you changed it and you said, right, imagine that the lives of the people that you love are on the line and you have to dispose this bomb, which is in that house where your family lives and you're on the conference call with a bomb disposal expert, like how would your, how would your performance change on that call? Mm -hmm. Right? Like even if the guy said cut blue wire, right? You'd be like, huh? what did you say? Did you say blue wire? Did you say what wire did you say? And yeah. they'd be like green. Okay. Cut the green. So you're saying cut the green. Yes. I'm saying cut then you'd cut it, right? Uh -huh. And so the performance is based on the way you're perceiving things, mm. right? And this, this is, this is a, like a much, much bigger topic, obviously, but a lot of the issues around confidence is the way you perceive yourself and mm. that changes everything as well. Yeah. How much do you think we can not, like, not actually be good at something, but then kind of uh, convince ourselves that we're actually quite good so we can be confident? Yeah, I think I think I think it's a lot. I think it's big, and and a lot of people that know me, they they know that this is where I'm kind of strong. Like I have beliefs that I have a belief that I will be able to do almost anything to an amazing level if I want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And probably that that's probably where the kind of confidence comes in, right? And I've found that to be true for myself, um, and I think it's true for most people. By the way, mm -hmm. I think most of the time our limiting chains and how we're stopped is by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's stopped by someone else. And I think that we can get a, a, a competence in something very, very quickly. And I think even, you know, the whole thing of around fake it till you make it. Yes. It definitely works. It mm. definitely works. Right. Mm. And it can be done. It's just, can you overcome your self doubt to fake it? Because most people can't do that. Right. Explain they, they what do that. you mean by self doubt then? So for example, like uh, imagine if I'm going to try and do something and I'm like, I'm just going to fake it till I make it. Yeah. Right this is what's going to happen in most people's mind. How can you fake it? People are going to know you're fake. How can you do that? You're wow. an imposter. Like you're not real. Why are you not being real? You're this, you're that, you're not, wow. you're not good enough anyway. You can't do it. Yeah. Right. And so this is another great thing for, for us to learn is that most of, most of uh, the mind is based upon what is based upon language. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the second law of performance is, is all about language saying that the performance is happening in language. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the level of language that you have will basically define the kind of, uh, kind of actions that you get. Mm, mm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it does. Yeah. So the, uh, self-talk, that's what they call it, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The self-talk yeah. will make yeah. a massive difference yeah. on yeah. what your level of confidence yeah. is. You know, uh, on that point, it's a little thing I do. I find it funny. Uh, I just want to share it. Yeah. You know, I've got these apps here on my phone, like Amazon, uh, what else do I have here? I've got Amazon uh, Noon, which is like uh, Amazon. I've got a sh uh, this um, shopping uh, loyalty points app. And I've got like a discounts app. I put them all together in a folder. Now, what did my phone suggest I call that folder? They suggest I call it shopping, right? Now, shopping is like so cool, right? Yeah, shopping. I'm going to go shopping. You know, shopping with my girlfriends, yeah? Uh, <laughs> what did I call it? I called it buying. Yeah. Mm. And just changing the name makes it sound like, okay, now buying, that means I'm spending money. Right? It's, mm. it's way less exciting. And yeah. 
I, I just did that off the top of my head. But then afterwards I realized when I look at it on my phone, I'm like, yeah, buying that, that it results in a completely different feeling for me than, than shopping. Because although I'm not, I don't shop, like I don't really care about that stuff, but definitely in my mind, shopping is way more positive than buying, you know? Mm. So that's like the power of language, Annie. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the truth is that you can do that with almost anything. Right. Mm. Uh, and you know what's even better about that? Is guess who has the choice to do it? Me. You. Yeah. Mm. Every one of us has a choice whenever anything happens to us to give it an empowering meaning or disempowering meaning. Mm. And no one's going to come and tell you anything. Like, even if you give it a disempowering meaning, you know, Allah's not going to come and say, How dare you give it a disempowering meaning? That, mm. Nothing's going to happen. Mm. Right. So you have the complete choice in your mind whether you give something an empowering meaning or a disempowering meaning. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm saying that if you can actually start to give yourself an empowering meaning, you will feel empowered. Yes. You know? Can you give me examples of like, whether it's uh, having a more empowering, less empowering meaning uh, to, a, to a, a situation or a word, and then also like how you could tweak a word, like what I just explained. Like, do you have any good examples? Um, well, generally, like if we just take an example of anything happening, Mm. Right. Um, so uh, let's say that someone in your family um, has a stroke. Okay. So this is a serious thing. This is a very like, uh, you know, big thing for someone to go through something like this. Yeah. Um, with something like that, the way you describe it in language is the way you're going to feel about it. Okay. Okay. So if I describe this as a terrible event that is uh, very painful and the end of my uh, relationship or something, I'm going to feel very differently to I'm glad that this person is still around and you know what? I'm grateful for every moment that comes after it. Mm. So you see just, just the same thing happened, but we're just telling different kind of stories around yes, it. Yes, right. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of this is about, and this is what I'm saying. It's a bit like, uh, you know, like, you know, personal development, especially in the mind, a lot of this is like building that mental muscle up yeah. where something like that can happen and you can actually force yourself to have an empowering kind of mindset. Mm. And I think one of the things we need to realize is that uh, the, the nafs that we have within ourselves, after you discipline a few times with something, mm. it will just kind of play along because it's too lazy to try 1,000 times <laughs> of resistance, right? Mm, yeah. It will try the first 5, 10, 15 times. And so when you start to talk to yourself in that way, then you'll find that that kind of uh, will continue if you're strict with yourself and you're kind of holding yourself. Mm. And this is why the, the other thing for me, bro, is that Really, I think that there's nothing more powerful than Islam uh, to give you confidence. That's mm. fundamentally like my, my bottom line of it all. I think there's so many great techniques out there. There's so much stuff. Um, but fundamentally, if you can take Islam to be your base level of confidence, then you're going you're gonna to fly it beyond what any man-made mm. techniques will do. Mm. Um, and the reason for that is because if you think about it, even our religion, the basis of it is all what? Language, Right. What is the Quran? Mm. The Quran are the words of Allah. So if we're saying the most powerful thing in changing our behavior is our paradigm, which is based upon language, and then what's the best thing you can do is actually take the language of Allah and instill it in your paradigm and use mm. that use as that your paradigm. As your, as your lens through which you see yes, the world. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And, and this is why I'm saying that one of the things that people misunderstand about Islam is that when it comes to salah, okay, I'll go and worship Allah. When it comes to adhkar, okay, I'll do adhkar. But when it comes to the way I see things, yes. I don't put Allah in there. Yes. What do I do? Yeah. I put my culture in there. I put my identity, yeah. my beliefs. Yeah. So for example, I was speaking to someone uh, just a day or two ago doing some uh, family mediation and marriage and stuff. And I was saying to him, look, this is the wrong thing to do. You know, this is the wrong thing to do. And he said, what? He said, Look, I know what you're saying. It's wrong. Okay, Islamically, it's wrong and stuff. But you know what? I just have to do what I have to do. Right? <laughs> and so what is this person doing? This person is taking the Islamic thing of what he should do, what Allah has commanded, what will make Allah happy, and he's putting it to the side. And he's bringing to the forefront his own ego, his own thinking of what he should do. Right? Mm. And I'm saying that true slavery of Allah, true ubudiyah is not just you worshipping Allah in the masjid five times a day, but it's actually taking your perspective and saying, you know my perspective, I'm actually going to give it irrelevance and cast I'm going to give aside. Allah's perspective. Yeah, mm. I'm going to cast that to the side and Allah's perspective, Allah's meaning of the world and everything in it, I'm going to yeah. give that priority and I'm going to make that my paradigm. Yes. You know? yeah. And I'm saying if you do that, you will actually uh, empower yourself and take your confidence to another level. Yeah. Because the ubudiyah of Allah is different to man-made slavery. 
because man-made slavery is all about, uh, you know, kidnapping and stealing and everyone hates the master and this and that. Whereas the slavery of Allah is actually you love Allah. You want mm -hmm. to get into that mm -hmm. slavery mm -hmm. and that frees you from everything. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's also deeper. Um, the slavery is much, 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 much deeper, right? Because when you enslave a person, for example, uh, you will force them to work against their will. Mm. Never will they want to work for you. Yeah. And also, you, you feed them whatever you want to feed them, and they just eat it because they have to eat it. Mm. They are not going to you know, look at the food that you give them and pick out of it, right? Based on what you would prefer they eat, for example, right? Mm. Also, when you know, the slave is never going to be given a, a, a mindset, a worldview by the master, because the master in the human sense, the master is just um, forcing you to work. He doesn't care how you think. For his own benefit. For his own benefit. Yeah. He doesn't care how you think. He's not going to give you a mindset that will help you uh, work better. No, he's going to work you. Uh, then when you get ill or you die, he'll get another one, right? Mm. But the slavery with Allah is so much deeper that Allah has given you an entire way to see the world, right? Mm. It, maybe you could see it as though, so the human master is giving you a pickaxe to work, for example, right? Allah has given you the pickaxe. He's given you glasses to see the world as well, though. He's mm. given you, um, I don't know, tools to rest better. He's given you uh, guidelines to uh, rest better, to eat better, to ev everything is covered, right? And what that does for you is two things. It, when, when you take that, what Allah has given you, all the tools Allah has given you, you worship him better, which gets you Jannah. And you also have a better life in the dunya. So exactly. it's, it's, it's very, very much different. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and just on the language point, uh, something, <laughs> again, it sounds nitpicky, this, but I feel like it's very powerful, man. Like uh, when I was teaching, and now, now that I'm a father, I think of this phrase, you're making me angry. And it's a very... Uh, interesting phrase uh, and it's a disempowering phrase mm -hmm. and teachers say it all the time oh abdullah you're really making me angry and by obviously what does the language there mean it means you have the power over me and you're forcing me to be angry um yes. and you could just make a little tweak there and you could say um i am getting angry or the the, <laughs> the technical way is to say it is accurately is to say I am about to choose to get angry. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. that's the empowering yeah. way to say one, it. One of, the, one of the ways people say it, and I remember one of the books that I read through, they were saying that, um, remember your emotions are things that you should be noticing and you should be feeling, yes. right? And so basically what, what they, they would say to say to yourself is, I'm noticing that I'm feeling angry. Okay. Right? Yeah. Because even then I'm kind of separate from my emotion. Yes. Right? Because if I say I'm feeling angry, it's kind of still a part of me. Yes. But what they're saying is I'm noticing, as in like I'm kind of outside of myself and I'm mm. self-aware enough yes. to notice that I'm feeling angry. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> now, this is good in theory, obviously. When you get angry, it's like, bring him here type of thing, you know? <laughs> um, but generally, I, I, think, I think like, you know, you're right. It, it's, it's so powerful. It's so uh, important. And I think that um, when it comes down to these kind of uh, habits that you're talking about, I think it's very, very important uh, to try and instill them and be careful with yourself. I remember I made this kind of uh, video where, you know, you just get into this natural habit. I think my brother, he was talking to me, he's much younger than me. And I'm just like, you can't do that. Mm. And then I thought to myself, you just put a complete limitation on him, right? Now, if he takes your limitation, then he has now got a new limitation because you put a limitation on him. Mm. So you need to be very careful rather than saying you can't do it. What yes. do you actually mean? Mm -hmm. right? Maybe you mean that you're unlikely to succeed if you take the route that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Perhaps an alternative route will be better. Right? But as human beings, we're lazy. right? We're lazy in our speaking. And we think that it doesn't have any impact. The problem is that it does have an impact. right? And that's why it's all about trying to communicate with yourself and others in a much, much uh, better way. Mm -hmm. And we need to realize that the, the benefit of doing that is far beyond just that conversation that we're having. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, bro, I wanted to get onto this, this whole thing of confidence. Yeah. 
a lot of people blame their failures in life on confidence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, do you buy into that? Do you think, yes, that is true and you need to fix that? Or do mm -hmm. you say, no, it's actually most of the time, it's not because of that. It's because of X, Y, Z. What do you, what, yeah. you know, what do you see? What do you think? So I think confidence will no doubt affect performance, right? So you imagine someone who's watching this, right? It's a brother. He's found a really good sister. He thinks this is the perfect sister for me to marry, right? I really want to marry this sister, right? What does he need to do? Well, he needs to go and meet the parents, okay? Now, imagine if you've got absolutely low confidence, like zero kind of confidence, okay? And you have to go and show that father that you are capable of not only marrying, but looking after and supporting and doing everything for his daughter. Mm -hmm. If you go there with, I'm talking like really rock bottom confidence, the father will say no to you. Right? So you imagine now, that means that it will affect your married life. If you go to a job interview with rock bottom confidence, you will not be given the job. Mm -hmm. That means in your financial and career life, it will affect you. So I believe confidence actually will affect every single part of your life, mm. your relationships, your finances, uh, even your spirituality. Imagine if I say to myself, you know what, bro? I don't think I can pray five times a day. Mm. Right? That, that's what happens. And this is why I always make a big point with this, that Allah has a guarantee for us. This is a wonderful, by the way, a wonderful uh, mindset thing, yeah? That Allah has guaranteed you. He said he will never, ever mm. put a burden upon you more than you can handle. You know, I love this because this is a guarantee from Allah saying, listen, bro, it's all good. You're never, ever going to be some, be given something that you can't deal with. Mm -hmm. Right. This is so empowering. By definition, bro. Like from, by by definition, definition, if you're getting it, you can, overcome yeah, it. you can handle it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is so empowering. If you, if you think about this, Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth who wrote your whole Qadr has already written your destiny is saying, I am never, ever going to give you something that you cannot handle. Right? So that means whatever you go through, you need to remind yourself that, you know what, I can handle it and Allah will help me with this because that will change your whole thing. And so with Salah, it's that type of thing. Allah would never say to you, pray mm. five times a day if you weren't capable. Why? Because it's unjust. If I know someone's not capable and I don't give them the ability to do it and then I say, you have to do it, this is unjust, but Allah is the most just. So if he said, you have to pray five times a day, that means you are completely capable. But mm. if your confidence is so low where you say, no, bro, I just don't think I can pray, right? That affects you. That's so confidence is confidence. so important. Yeah, shaitan confidence, right? Mm. That it actually affects every part of your life, mm. right? Mm. But I think one more point I want to make here is, bro, is that a lot of the times in our life when we're doing something bad or something like that, we don't really think about confidence. It's when we're doing something good that we start doing equations in our head about confidence, right? Maybe because shaitan, he does give you that false sense of confidence, right? That's his trick, isn't it? Making you feel like, oh, yeah, it's okay. Just go for it. You can do it. You can do the haram. You can do the haram, right? And he makes you feel good about it. But fundamentally, you know, when it comes to good, then you're like, oh, but they might think this of me. And maybe they're going to ask about my intentions and I'll just mm -hmm. not do it, right? So it's, it's important. And then the last thing I'd say bro, about that is that, we have to realize, although confidence plays a massive part in it, a lot of this is to do with responsibility, okay? Because what happens is most people, like you were saying, in language, they give the other people the power. Ultimately, people don't take responsibility, right? Like, whichever part of life you're in now, you have to take a responsibility for where you are right now. Whatever it is in your life, your health, your wealth, like whatever it is, if you don't take responsibility for it, what it means is that you are just here at the will of circumstances and you have absolutely no, no, you have nothing you can do in the matter, right? And that's so disempowering, right? Mm. And that's not the case either. So for us, we need to take responsibility. So if there's an area that you're struggling in, or if there's something you want to build confidence in, the first thing you need to do is you need to actually take responsibility. And you need to say, look, this is something that's not right. I have power over this, but I'm not doing what I should do. I need to fix it. Mm. And, and that's different from blaming yourself, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think like one thing I was working with a client recently and um, we we're talking about forgiveness mm. and we were saying that, you know, he's been through some really bad kind of big health issues, right? Um, and he was thinking about his family and he was like, you know, I've really let my family down and I'm really upset and this and that. And so we talked about all of that. And then I said, I said, do you forgive yourself for where you've got to now? 
Like you're, you're really upset about where you are. Do you forgive yourself? And he had never thought about it that way. And he kind of came to the conclusion, yes, I do forgive myself. Most of the time, bro, we're more harsh to ourselves than we will be to someone else. And so what I said to that person is that from now on, what I would like you to do is I would like you to treat yourself like you would a friend, right? Because most of the time we're so harsh with each other. And this, this is the problem. Like we go through extremes, right? Either we're super harsh with, with ourselves and we're like really beating ourselves down or we go to the other extreme where we're not holding ourselves accountable at all and we're just doing whatever we want, you know? And for us, it's about kind of trying to bring that balance in that when we're too free, we pull ourselves back. When we're too harsh, we pull ourselves back. And it's about trying to be balanced in your approach with things with yourself. Yeah, sure. And, and so now when it comes to developing confidence, we'll get into mm -hmm. that now, inshallah. Yeah. Um, so looking at myself, friends, family, there's definitely a difference between us, right? When it comes to confidence. Mm. Is this, is it nurture? Is it nature? Is it a bit of both? You know, I, I would, I would guess that it's m way more than 50% nurture, but there's different stages in life, right? So the, closer to when you're first born it basically if you uh receive nurturing that decreases your confidence when you're very young that will probably compound right uh, and so it's much harder for you to become confident later in life if that happened if however you were kind of average confidence if you like uh until age 15 and then you took a blow you're, you have less time where it's compounding, right? So, mm. like, would you agree with that? And, uh, yeah, do you think it's, like, genetic, like, nature, nurture, all that? Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, definitely a mixture. I think that some people naturally are, are born with, uh, you know, different skills and different qualities. So, for example, you know, uh, naturally someone who is very beautiful, let's take a female who's very beautiful, um, she may naturally gain more confidence because people are constantly telling her that she's beautiful. Mm, validating. Right? Yeah, validating it all the time. So in her head, it just gets like, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful. Yeah. And, yeah. and like that kind of gives it confidence, right? Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you might have someone who is, uh, let's say, very uh, overweight. So someone's always, the people are always telling you overweight, you're overweight, and that might kind of like affect their thing. Mm. So the the environment will have a massive impact on it. Yeah. But then there's also there's also other abilities, right? So someone might naturally be very good at speaking. Someone might read a lot of books, and therefore they're very good at writing, right? And so just because they have that quality, that can also increase their confidence as well. So mm. I think it's like a it's like a real mixture, but. For me, fundamentally, even if you don't have the nature, even if you don't have uh, any of that stuff, I still believe through believers' confidence and Islam, you can get to the level you need to get to. And why am I saying that is because if you just, this is why I say Islam is the ultimate tool for human development, because when it comes down to it, they are friends of mine who would eat pork and who would uh, webinize and drink alcohol and do all this kind of stuff. And today they are Muslim and they hate the idea of doing any of that. And now they are completely different as human beings to where they were before. And why is that? It's only because of Allah's guidance and Islam, right? And so Islam has the power that it doesn't matter where you start from. What matters is, are you sincere to this? Are you willing to sacrifice your own desires for what Allah wants? And if you're willing to do that, this will raise your status. It is automatic. Like you could just be going to the masjid walking and your rank would increase just by you doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, it doesn't matter if you've, if you've had the worst start, you could be that guy who's gone to prison and had life of crime and this and that. You see what happens with someone like Malcolm X. Like even though you've had all of that, mm. you can still come out with Islam to be a, a completely different person who's full mm. of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I'm saying that it's important to remember that when I'm talking about believers' confidence, I'm saying these people are confident, but at the heart of it, they're humble. And they know that their true confidence is reliant completely upon Allah. Yes. This reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet we said, Man uh, oh, rafa'ah. Whoever humbles himself to Allah, then Allah will raise him. Yeah. So, so 
unleash it, bro. Spill the beans. Tell me about uh, Believer's Confidence. Because I think we spoke about it very briefly. Um, yeah. I described the kind of what I was thinking. And then you're like, yeah, that's Believer's Confidence. So explain the yeah. full model to us. And uh, sure. yeah, let's dive into it, inshallah. Okay. So this is so from the perspective of somebody now wanting to develop their confidence but in the right way and based on Islam, like you're saying. So yeah. So what I would say, first of all, bro, is that it's very important to remember, I want to define for you the opposite before we go into what it is, right? Okay. So the opposite of that is actually what I call ego confidence. Mm. Okay. So the opposite is, is not lacking confidence? Uh, no, but I'm talking about if you were developing the confidence. Because okay. even like, let's say you say that, okay, I want to be more confident today. Mm. How do I do it? Well, I'll just go to a Tony Robbins course or I'll just go to a non-Muslims course, yes. right? Um, and I'm saying that these will give you confidence but these will give you ego confidence. So what I'm saying is fundamentally, there's a right type of confidence and there's a wrong type of confidence. Okay. And I'm saying the ego confidence is the wrong one in my opinion. Right. Yeah. What is ego confidence? It focuses on enlarging the ego. Okay. So it's like, oh yeah, I mean, you're so great. You're so wonderful. It's like, you're the ultimate guy. Right. When it comes to um, the other side of it, we're like, uh, we promote human beings are self-sufficient. That's what ego confidence is about. You don't need anyone. You're so great. You're so amazing, right? Um, you deserve then it. Then you deserve it, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then, and then what they do is they rely on the program. They rely on Tony Robbins to sort them out and give me confidence. Where am I going to get confidence from? From Tony Robbins, right? He's going to inject um, it into you. Yeah, he's going to inject it in me, right? <laughs> and, then, and then there's like a lot of the confidence will come through some form of arrogance, right? Mm. And in, in, in line with that, it's kind of weak intentions. Why? Because it's just about me. It's about my nafs feeling good about myself. Now, there's nothing wrong about you, with you feeling good about yourself, but it, it kind of focuses all on you and making everything good. It uses man-made theories, right? Techniques that come from human beings. Not that they can't be right, they can't be powerful, but they're not as good as, as, as uh, other techniques, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and also what it does, bro, is that although it makes you feel a bit more confident, deep down there's also the underlying fears there, which don't really get resolved. Right, mm -hmm. um, and and it's all about looking good. It's about looking confident. Shaming right? good, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I remember, and uh, what book talks about that kind of in depth? Is it Seven Habits? Um, let's talk about. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's that book. Um, uh, one of the communication books, either nonviolent communication or maybe crucial conversations, where it was talking about those two models for developing yourself or developing communication. One is about seeming developed and the other is actually being developed. Yeah. Seven habits, I think, actually. It might be seven habits. Mm. Yeah, because they do talk about development at the start. So mm. this, this is the thing, right? Like you look like you're confident, but deep mm. down there's fears. And then the other thing is all, it's all driven by the dunya, right? Mm. Anytime, like I went to this amazing course. It was amazing, bro. Like for a non-Muslim course, it was wonderful. And they, they had these circles, concentric circles of everything. You, your family, your, your uh, neighborhood, your community, everything except, mm. except Allah, right? Mm. So there's going to be like a deficiency. And ultimately, I believe ego confidence is going to lead to Jahannam because we know when it came to Shaitan, it was all about arrogance, right? Now, what is believer's confidence? Believer's confidence, rather than focusing on enlarging the ego it focuses on connecting to allah right mm. actually connecting yourself to allah instead of promoting that we as human beings are self-sufficient it says that we are completely reliant upon allah okay all of the reliance is, is on allah and rather than being confident through like our own arrogance is confidence through humility right mm. and and this is to do with having like noble intentions and having a, a life that's pleasing to allah right and it encourages giving to uh, others serving Allah, serving his deen. Um, but one of the best things about it, bro, is that rather than it being man-made techniques, it's actually divine guidance. It's from Allah, who is basically giving us the critical ingredients for development and for success, right? Mm. Uh, and it's, it's about really mastering influence. It's not about looking good. I don't care if I look good or not. I care about, can I move you closer to Allah, right? Um, and really, the truth is that if you have Allah with you, your level of fear is different to if you don't have Allah with you, right? Um, and fundamentally, it's, it's like driven by the Akhirah. Like the way we look at confidence or anything is like everything is looked through the lens of the Akhirah and looking at the lens through the way Allah said your paradigm should be built. So for me, both of these ways build ego, but only one of them really focuses on, on Allah and connecting to Allah. 
Mm. And, and so the ego confidence is about saying, I, I can lean on myself in this world, right? I'm the best. I'm, I'm as good. I'm going to serve myself the best, mm. right? So if I'm going to lean on anything for support, it's going to be myself, right? I rely on myself. And the believer's confidence is I can't do much myself. Nothing happens without the will of Allah. Exactly. And ultimately, how, like, if I can't even, you know, pick my nose without Allah's permission, then obviously Allah is infinitely more powerful and able to make me able uh, than me. So I'm going to lean on Allah, basically. I'm going to, exactly. in obviously, we're not the ones enlarging Allah, but in our minds, we're bigging up Allah. We're saying, yes. Allah is able to do this, and that allows me to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, and then they were doing what you said, which is through enlarging Allah in our, in our mind, we're reducing our arrogance and our ego, and therefore Allah is raising us. Mm, yes. Right? And yes. so, and so and I'll give you a real practical example of this. There's a really good book by Susan Jeffers called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Mm -hmm. Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And this is actually a very good book about fear. I remember someone commented, they said, J I just read the title and I never had to read the book because it's giving you the full instruction, right? Okay. If you feel fearful about something, yeah. feel the fear and do it anyway, right? Like yeah. just do it. Don't let the fear stop you. Yeah. But there's one technique that they give. If you use it, it's very powerful for overcoming fear. Okay. And what they do is they take self-talk and they take all of that and they make it into a very simple thing. So let's say there's something that's come up in your life now, like a bill that you can't handle or a tragedy or something, right? What they do is they say one simple phrase you should say to yourself and it will help you. That phrase is, I will handle it. Mm. I will handle it. Like, because when something happens fearful to you, your fear is you're out of control. You don't mm. know what to do, how you to handle, handle it. it yeah. So Exactly. So the, the phrase that you use is anything that comes up, like there's a snake in my room, I will handle it. Mm. Okay. Like I will handle it. Mm. What I did with that phrase is I said, again, this is ego confidence. I know deep down I can't handle it. Firstly, a snake in my room, I cannot handle it. Yes. But I'm very confident. And this way confidence goes up. I'm very confident Allah can handle it. Yeah. So what I do is when I face a fear, I will say, don't worry, Allah will handle it. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Allah will handle it. And then when you, yes. if you put that with the other phrase that we discussed before, yeah. which is that Allah will never give me something I can't handle. Yes. Yeah. Right? So now I'm in a situation which I'm fearful of, but I know Allah will never give me a situation I can't handle so I can handle it, but Allah will handle it for me. Right. And you yeah. take your trust and you put it in the one who is the best to place your trust in and you have a recipe for success. Yeah. And, and you can even imagine this is where the, the world view comes in. Right. Because it's like, I can't see how this can be overcome. So imagine, uh, yes. Ghazwat, uh, Ghazwat Badr, Ghazwat Uhud, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And you can imagine the Sahaba couldn't imagine how this battle could be won. Yeah. Uh, but they knew that it could be won through Allah. So it's like yes. we can't really work out how through our own tactics, our own power, we can win. But we know Allah's able, right? And Allah might use the means of my, my strength. But Allah might also use a, a dust storm or angels or X, Y, Z, right? So the, the same applies to us today, right? Um, you know, if you're in a, a lot of debt and you get made redundant or something, again, you might not be able to see how you can get out of that rut, but Allah has helped people get out of bigger ruts than that before, mm. right? So how do you break this believer's confidence down in terms of like, I don't know, some kind of a parts or like a model or like... Yeah. 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 So for me, like it, it's not only about feeling confident, right? Mm. For me, there's a couple of elements that go with it. So mm. the first element is for you to internally feel mm. confident, mm. right? The second thing is actually for you to express, express it through speaking. Mm. So you have to not only feel confident, but you have to express yourself effectively, right? Mm. And then of course, you've got to take action as well. Right. Mm. And, and this is also based on if you think about how the scholars define Iman. So they yeah. say Iman is something that's in the heart mm. and it's tongue. professed by the tongue mm. and it's acted upon by the limbs. Right. So for me, I don't like just taking confidence as one thing because it could just be something in the heart. Rather, what I say is that it's about you being confident internally, speaking with impact and taking action. 
right? Um, and all of that is based upon you taking action for the sake of Allah, being confident for the sake of Allah, all of this stuff, right? Because we know that if you have an intention to do something with the pleasure of Allah, that takes even a normal action of wearing a red jumper or going to sleep or doing anything and makes it an act of worship, right? So in that same way, this is what I'm saying that for me, it's about four different phases. So for confidence, what we do in our program, for example, is the first thing we do is actually we get you to connect with yourself, mm. okay? Because a lot of this is to do with the self, right? So we get you to connect with yourself and connect with uh, who you are as a human being, right? And, and then uh, part of that is understanding like what is your purpose as a human being, right? And then, so there's the connection with yourself, mm. this connection with Allah. So once you kind of got yourself ready, then it's like the first thing you want to do is connect with Allah. When you've connected with Allah, then you need to make sure that you are able to connect with people, right? Because once you and Allah are correct, you've got Allah's paradigm in your thinking and your views, then you go and connect with the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then part of connecting with human beings is actually understanding how communication works, understanding how things work. Because, you know, there's like lots of different things about human beings, which are kind of crazy. I'll give you an example, like typical obvious ones uh, between men and women. Right. So men, for example, when they have a problem, they just want to forget about it. Okay. When women have a problem, they just want to discuss it. Okay. So what happens is, right. The man comes home and he goes, I'm really stressed. Right. And the wife goes, Oh, tell me everything about it. Right. Like what happened? What's going on? He's like, I don't want to talk about it. And she's like, just talk to me about it. And he's like, I don't want to talk about it, right? Mm. And like, oh, we don't communicate. End up right? annoying him, yeah. Yeah, end up annoying each other, right? Mm. Or if the woman comes home and she goes, I've got, I've got a big issue. He's like, oh, okay, don't worry, it'll be fine. And he crosses over it. Yeah. And she's like, <laughs> well, we need to discuss it, this and that, yeah. right? Yeah. And so just by having two slightly different like, human beings, like everything changes. So knowing yourself is important. No, uh, connecting with Allah is important. Connect, connecting with people, but also understanding how communication works, how it can be more effective, less effective, uh, and working with that so that you can actually have confidence. You can speak effectively and then go and take the action as well. So, so it's uh, if we to recap, it's connect with yourself, connect yep. with Allah, and yes. then connect with the wider world with people. People and communication. So for me, this is this is where a lot, yeah, because a lot of people, what happens is they stop, and this is what happens with a lot of the great speakers I know, by the way. They're good at connecting with themselves. They're great at connecting with Allah, and they're good at connecting with people. Mm -hmm. But that's where they stop, right? Okay. And that's the point where someone like me comes in and goes, "Hold on, let me explain to you how communication works. What the objective of communication is. How can you make your communication even more effective? How can you increase your influence? And all those things, which most people, even great speakers, don't ever think about mm, mm, okay and i'm trying to think because uh i think a lot of the time with me for example i i think of confidence like we were saying as a feeling uh within mm -hmm. yourself and that might yeah. result in action okay but how does how do i increase my confidence through connecting with people or communicating where does that come in yeah connecting with people yeah, that, that's, that's more to do with speaking. So like we're saying, the natural effect of confidence will be self-expression. Oh, okay. Right? Mm. So when you self-express, you have to have a level of confidence in your self-expression. And mm. in order for you to, to actually express properly, you have to be connected with those people. So do you, if, I, if I'm like very isolated, mm -hmm. you would say that would hamper my confidence? No, I... I I don't think it would hamper your confidence. Sometimes it can actually help your confidence. Why? Because you never enter anything of negativity in front of you. Yeah. yeah. So you become overconfident, right? Where you yeah. just think, well, I'm just amazing. And I've never yeah. like lost anything in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it will hamper it. But for me, what I'm saying is that what is the point of you being confident mm. if you are not going to speak for Allah, if you're not going to take action for Allah, mm. right? So confidence should just be seen as one of those stepping stones to greatness. And the way that greatness is going to come is by either you speaking or doing amazing things. Mm, right? okay. And so, so it has to manifest itself in mm. either you speaking or you doing. Yes. And so I'm saying that speaking element of it is, is, is what I specialize in alongside the confidence mm. to try and get people to communicate more effectively to achieve more. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I get it. So uh, that's, a, that's such an important point about believers' confidence then is that the end goal and the objective of it 
is to take positive action for the sake of Allah. It's impact. It's all about yeah. doing mm. impact in your life. And this impact could be, it doesn't have to mean that you have to become a YouTube star or you have <laughs> to be a sheikh or an alim or anything like that. It could just be you making a difference in your life and the life of your family. And that's mm. it. Yes, yeah. yes. And we say that's it, but you know, ultimately that's a very big deal, isn't it? Yeah, um, exactly. So that's, that's very clear then. So there's like those four parts to it. So how does one get started with like, uh, connecting with yourself? Yeah, this is a good question. So with connecting with yourself, it's all about understanding uh, who you are. What do I mean by that? There's different levels of it. So one side is actually understanding your purpose overall, right? That's one of the best things you can do for knowing yourself because the question of who am I, what's my identity, it has to be connected to something, right? So the person we want to connect to as believers is Allah. So Allah is saying that your purpose, I didn't just create you for no reason at all, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I created you for a purpose. That purpose is to worship Allah alone, right? Um, and then alongside that, Allah says that he created death and life as a test, okay? So from this, we're starting, and this is the beauty of guidance, right? That we're starting to be guided upon what our life is all about. Mm -hmm. Our life is all about worshiping Allah. It's all about these tests and passing these tests in the best way, right? Yeah. So that we can achieve uh, what our ultimate purpose is, which is mm -hmm. to get to Jannah. We are beings that are ultimately made for Jannah, right? So our aim is to do that. So once you start to understand, okay, that's my overall perspective, then I would advise you to then go on. So what we do in the program, we actually, from there, we go, okay, based on that, what is your path to paradise? Because now that you know generally my objective is to get to Jannah, the truth is there's thousands of ways to get to Jannah, right? If you look at hadith, like just by you mm -hmm. saying uh, this uh, ayat al-Kursi after every salah, there's nothing between you and uh, Jannah except death, right? Mm -hmm. That's one simple way of, of getting there, right? Same with this amazing hadith we go through in the program, which is where uh, they asked the Prophet, the Prophet said that on the day of judgment, there's going to be people who the prophets and the martyrs are basically envious of. Mm. And he said, who are they? He said, they are those people who uh, basically love one another just for the sake of Allah, right? So even me just loving someone or deciding that I'm going to love all Muslims and people for the sake of Allah could be a path to paradise. So what we do is we say right now that you kind of uh, know your ultimate purpose, what's your path to paradise? Which one do you enjoy? Which ones are your strengths? Which ones are the ones that you love doing? And trying to align your life in a way which it kind of deals with what we call ikigai, right? Which is to do with what you love doing, uh, what fill fulfills the need, uh, what's your passion, what's your strengths, what, what can you earn uh, a risk from as well, right? And finding that kind of thing that you really want to kind of focus on. Because as we know, I mean, like focus is a massive thing, right? And so for us, it's like finding your path to paradise and then living that path. And part of that path, once you get good at something, what happens is your natural next step is to teach it to others and help others and stuff. So it's, this is not just about confidence and just feeling confident. This is about getting your whole life on track in terms of what impact am I going to have? What actions am I going to take? And where am I ending up in terms of my everyday stuff? Mm. So if we look at <clears throat> path to paradise or yeah. path to paradise, <laughs> yeah. um, path to paradise. So, yeah. uh, is, is this like the way I, I think about uh, goals? So I think about goals in two ways. Either six-month habits, which are like mm -hmm. I must be doing every week or every day or whatever. Yeah. And th then I never go to one year or three year goal. I, I, don't, I don't do that. I do mm -hmm. six months and then I do general lifetime direction. This yeah. whole lifetime direction thing is going to be more uh, general, more vague, but it's a direction, right? Is that what you mean by path to paradise? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so what I mean is generally, like what are the, because I'll give you an example, yeah? Um, part of confidence and developing confidence is about doing confidence building habits, okay? Right? There are habits you can do every single day that will help build the believer's confidence, okay? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're grateful to Allah every day, that will build your believer's confidence, mm -hmm. right? So there's real habits that you can do every single day. Right. In the same way, if you think about it, there's going to be some people who really enjoy reading Quran, but don't really enjoy fasting that much. Okay. There's going to be people who really love reading Salah, right? But they don't really enjoy reading Quran. 
right? So even with acts of worship, there'll be some acts of worship that we really like, whether it's giving charity or this or that. And there'll be those that we might not like so much, mm -hmm. right? So if you know that you can fast with your eyes closed every single day, right? Maybe your path to paradise is about planning. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the fasting of Dawood al Islam, and I'm mm -hmm. just going to fast every second day, yeah. right? So in my life now, one of my paths to paradise is my fasting. Yeah. Right. Another thing you might see that one the hadith. This is an amazing hadith, Prophet that yes. you know there's different ranks of uh, people. Right. You got Muslims, you got Mu'mins, and you got Muslims. Right. And you know sometimes I, I read these ayahs about Mu'mins, and I'm like, am I one of them? I don't know. Like I profess to be a Muslim, mm -hmm. but am I actually a Mu'min? Right. Yeah. And there's this hadith of Prophet where he says, no one except a Mu'min will stay in wudu. Mm. Right. Now for me, that's like a bit of a life hack, right? Because that's saying, look, I don't know if I'm a mu'min, but the Prophet is saying that no one will ever stay in wudu all the time unless it's a mu'min. Mm. So you could reverse that, inverse that and go, so if I stay in wudu all the time, by that rationale, I'm a mu'min, right? Yeah. So, well, maybe like, you know, my, my, my kind of biological clock is that good that I don't really pass wind that much. I don't, okay, maybe I'm just going to stay in wudu all the time. Right? Mm. And so with these kind of paths, it's about you clarifying how am I going to get to Jannah? How am I going to get close to Allah? How am I going to please Allah on yeah. a daily basis? Yes. No? So how many paths to paradise would you say, you know, we should kind of plan? So I would say that overall, you should have one uh, overall thing. So for me in my life, what I'm really passionate about, and this is what I'm saying, it doesn't just come from uh, the religious side. For me, I'm actually really passionate about growth and development and helping people. Okay. So for me, the way I see my path to paradise is for me, it's all about moving people closer to Allah, right? Mm. Fundamentally, that's what I want to do in my life. I want mm. to move people closer to Allah. Now, how am I going to do that? I'm going to do it through growth and development, right? So through growth and development, because that's what I love. And that's why with Muslim CEO, I grow and develop businesses because I love growth and development. So for me, fundamentally, I want to grow and develop people to be amazing using Islam and because I'm using Islam, they will get closer to Allah. They'll become better versions of themselves and they will then impact the world more. Mm. So for me, that's my overall path to paradise. Like I could go and I could just be giving lectures. I could be teaching Quran to children. I could do all kinds of things. Mm. But for me, no, no, it's fundamentally about getting people to become people of impact. And that's why I'm doing confidence because if you go through the confidence program, there is no way that you cannot get close to Allah because I'm going to take your existing paradigm and I'm going to replace it with Allah's paradigm. Right. Yeah. And then I'm going to build in the reasons why you need to pray, why you need to build these habits and all this stuff. So the whole thing is, although it's going to give you confidence, although it's going to help you speak, fundamentally, it's going to move you closer to Allah and make you a person of impact. Inshallah. Mm, inshallah. Do you think it could be a good path to paradise to say, I, j I want to be a really good family man. Like mm. I'm going to give my because it, it's kind of a struggle these days or it's uncommon. Yeah, to really like do that, if you know what I mean, like it, and it sounds kind of dumb, maybe for some people. It sounds un, uh, what's that word? It's not fancy. Unambitious, ambitious, unambitious. Yeah. It's not fancy. It's not. Yeah, it sounds like a basic thing, but most of us yeah. are not really doing this basic thing. So you could say, uh, "I'm going to be a really good family man." That means that a lot of what I do is going to be catered around giving my kids the best thing, spending real time with them. Um, working on my relationship with them, working on my communication with my kids, with my wife. Like, that could be a thing, right? Yeah, I, I think like, it reminds me of like, when I was working in Aero, right? So with Aero, we were doing global dawah, right? Actually inviting non-Muslims all around the world to Islam. And everything was a bit about that. And I, one day, I don't know, I just sat back and I was thinking I was probably at a non-Muslim course and they inspired me, right? I sat back and I thought to myself, you know what? Like, probably because of me, there's people in every part of the world that have received dawah because of my efforts, alhamdulillah, through the team and setting up Ayura. And I was like, there's cousins of mine that are probably not received the message of Islam properly. Mm. As in like, they grew up Muslims, but they don't know Islam is what I know Islam is, mm. right? So at that time, I was like, whoa, this was like a bit of a, it was like a hypocritical type of slap for me that you're off doing dawah to the whole world and maybe your first cousins don't know nothing about Islam. Mm. Right. So I had this amazing thing where Alhamdulillah, I did something called the family of Jannah, which was an event where I invited, like I've got hundreds of cousins. I invited them all to this really nice hall. We had food, we had great speakers and formally introduced Islam and gave them dawah to them, you know? Mm. Um, so for me, it was like, yeah, like the, the family and all this stuff, because Allah says, save yourself and your families. Right. So that comes first. So for me, I'm, I'm really like this idea of, um, 
actually being a family man and spend time. Why? Because I think that when you do that, you produce offspring, especially if you're doing it Islamically, you produce the type of offspring and the, the human beings that we need for the future of the summa, inshallah. Yeah. So I think it's very good from that perspective. The only thing I would say, and this is, I think most people make this mistake, whether they're into dawah or they're into tabliq or whatever, is most people are quite extreme in what they do, right? Mm. So for example, they will go very heavy on family and they will play absolutely no part in anything else, mm. right? Or they'll go very heavy on the masjid and do absolutely nothing else. And I think that as Muslims, like we should definitely be focused, but I think that we need to be quite, we need to be a little bit like T-shaped, right? Where we definitely go deep into certain areas, but we're also wide. So just because I'm always looking after my kids, it doesn't mean that I don't give sadaqah to Syria, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or just because I'm praying all the time in the masjid, it doesn't mean that I can't help in the community somehow. Yeah. So I think it's about kind of having that balance. And sometimes that can come through, uh, you know, different types of your, times of your life, you're doing different projects. So right. for example, there's a time in my life when I was just doing like telephone helpline stuff, right? Um, and then there's other times when I'm trying to do my own project with Muslim Mastery to try and build it up. So I think during your life and phase, you're going through different things. But I actually think that, um, you know, the family man thing is very important. And I think for me personally, this is one of the focuses that I want to do as well, because although I think there's a lot of benefit in building businesses, building organizations, I think for an individual to build their children is probably going to be the single most rewarding thing with the most potential of success because you have the most control, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas with an organization, you don't have that much control. Mm. So even for me, like as my children are getting older, this is exactly what I'm thinking now that I need to focus much more on that side of things rather than focusing mm. on, you know, businesses and all this stuff. Mm. Yeah. You reminded me of that. It was a blog post written by, uh, it was on the blog, wait, is it wait, but why? Anyway, really good blog post. And basically it talked about how life is short and this and that, but it's mm. also long in a sense where if you were to live till 70, 80, whatever, you actually have a, quite a few seven year periods in your life. Mm. And so if you were to focus on one thing for every seven year period, you would actually accomplish a lot and in mm. a deep way because seven years is, is a deep yeah. thing, right? So you could, in that critical part of your kid's life, let's say seven to 14, that is your family man uh, period where that's 70% of your focus, let's say. Because T-shaped, I was thinking about it, it's like 70 deep and then 30 wide, something like that, mm. right? So yeah, you can have a seven year period like that. But then when your kids are 14, you know, let's be real, you're not going to have such a big impact on them from that age onwards, right? So 14 to, from when they're 14 to 21 that's another seven year period that's when actually you can um you could then focus on dawa or whatever it is right a charity work or uh, helping other people's kids for example right so that's a good way to think about it and, and that's also why i I, fe I feel it's good to have kids early because yeah. what you want is i think a lot of people they think of um when i'm young i need to do all this stuff then I'm going to have kids. I'm just going to like have kids and wife and kids and kind of that's it. Right. But no, if you think about it, even that doesn't make sense because uh, we know the age of maturity is 40. Okay. So how are you going to say that the most impactful, important part of your life is going to be before 40? You don't even know what you're doing before 40 person. Mm. Right. So what you, what I think anyway, is that you should aim to do if possible is, Obviously, uh, ages up to, let's say, 25 or whatever, you're going to be uh, doing your bachelor thing, right? You're going to be uh, have a lot of time to do all these different things. And that's a great time for development, right? To focus on yourself, developing yourself. But if you were to have kids at uh, 25, then when you're 40, they're actually those, at least the younger one, is going to be uh, 15. So now when you're 40, you can go a, a little bit more focus on stuff outside of the home. And you're 40, like you're still young. You still got energy, inshallah. So I feel like there's two periods of impact, if you like, and it's before you have kids. And then when your kids are around that 15, 16 kind of uh, age group, you know, mm. I, think, I think this is one of the real challenges, actually, that mm. what path do you go down? Because what happens with most people is mm. they go down the money path, right? Yeah. First, 
Okay. And a lot of people don't figure it out for a long time. Mm. Um, my journey was a little bit different because I think I started practicing quite heavily, like uh, just after uni uh, and I got into volunteering. Mm. So I kind of like dedicated my life towards volunteering. Mm -hmm. Now on one hand, that's, that's like something um, which is very detrimental to your wealth, right? Because yeah. the years where you're supposed to be building, uh, you know, money and businesses and, and focusing on making money, you're focusing on something like volunteering. Yeah. But then uh, another view is really amazing because it means I gave what I feel are my like most attentive years, like no family, nothing to the cause of Allah. Right. So from that perspective, it's really good. But then what that means is that if you do that, then later on, you're going to be focusing on money. And that's what's happened mm. to me where yeah. I feel like, you know, the first 10 years of my kind of working life was focused more around voluntary and that kind of stuff. And then it's after that where I was like, once I had kids who were like getting to an age where I was like, what kind of life do I want to give them? It was at that age when I started thinking about money because before then I never really cared about money, right? Mm -hmm. It's only when I started thinking, what kind of life do I want to give them? Do I want to sell them to a public school? No, I don't, right? Mm -hmm. How do I want to educate them? Well, how much is that going to cost? How is that going to work, mm -hmm. right? That's when I started thinking about money. So then I started playing the money game quite late mm. you know and that's why the phase i'm in now is actually about the whole mastering of money and then once this is done then i want to kind of move away from that yeah. you know so i think it's about like trying to understand which phase is best i don't think there's one good phase i think a lot of it depends on circumstances as well mm -hmm. right things will happen in your life which will just force you down uh, a different route and you might have to do this like you know a lot of it if, if your family's in big trouble financially it may be that you have to like let go of studying and just work full-time yeah. right this is just how life is and so then you might decide well i'm just gonna work and, and do money for the first seven years but you might be in a position where you can just do i'm gonna be head president of the isoc i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that i'm just gonna go down that route or you yeah. might get married at 19 and you think right i'm just gonna focus on my wife and kids for the first few years yeah so it's about kind of making that that right decision but i think fundamentally what we need to remember is that ultimately any decision we make should be akhira focused as well as dunya, obviously, mm -hmm. but really taking that into consideration that what's going to take me closer to Allah and what's going to give me a better akhir, mm -hmm. uh, And also seeing life in, you know, phases rather than just, yeah. you know, oh, I did that, right? Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bro. And and in terms of, um, actually, wait, I want to I want to go into something like very uh, kind of practical or specific, but mm -hmm. um, before we go on to that, like. We've talked about the four stages, if you like, of the believer's yeah. confidence. Is there anything like that you want to elaborate on or anything you want to add to it, or a bonus stage or something that we haven't mentioned yet? Um, I think what I would do is uh, like from a very simplistic perspective, I would say there's only three things that matter. Okay. Right. Uh, so the three things that matter. The first is building. Why are you belief. laughing, bro? Why are you laughing? I'm laughing because I'm laughing because we always do the three things that matter, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the three. Th uh, Tony Robbins calls it the three to thrive, right? Okay. And uh, you know, Sheikh Sam calls it the, you know, the only three things that matter. So, yeah. like, what what I would say is the first thing is building that believer's confidence. What is this all about? This is about you connecting with Allah. And, and getting that humility and, and raising yourself to a level where you're willing to do and work for Allah. Because if you're working for Allah, there should be no fear there or you should still take action even if there's fear. Mm. So the first thing should be uh, all about, uh, you know, going out there uh, and building that confidence. The second thing I would say would be is actually speaking for Allah. Okay. Um, and, and this is so important. Speaking for Allah in every moment. Last night I was sitting here in a room doing family mediation. And every part of me is saying, just don't say anything, just leave it. It'll be easier, quieter, it'll finish sooner if you don't say what you're going to say. Yeah. Okay. But I know fundamentally my job in this, my test in this situation is to speak for Allah, right? In the sense that to try and guide these people to what Allah would love them to do and what Allah would hate for them to do. Mm. Right. So, for example, if someone's going to do the major sin of cutting ties in that moment, my job, my test of speaking for Allah mm. is saying, look, major sin is cutting ties. Do not do it. Da, 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 da. Encourage them to be patient. All those things. Yeah. So <clears throat> for me, the second thing, apart from confidence matters, is actually being that person who in all the conversations he's having is speaking for Allah. Right. And now, of course, it's not every time I backbite, I commit sins, I do everything from my tongue, right? But I'm saying that generally our aim should be that when we're in communication somewhere, we're speaking for the sake of Allah. That means 
encouraging people to good and encouraging people to patience, enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. Now, of course, <clears throat> part of that is you doing good yourself. Because if I keep telling my cousins, for example, look, you need to maintain ties by inviting that family to the wedding. And then when I get married, I don't invite any of the family I'm not talking to to the wedding. It doesn't make sense, right? So there's an element of that that has to be, I have to be in principle correct myself, but also advising people. So I would say second thing, speak for Allah. The mm -hmm. third thing for me is just about having ihsan, right? What do I mean by ihsan? Ihsan is you trying to do the best for Allah, having very high standards, right? And then constantly improving and iterating and improving and iterating and impacting. Improve, iterate, impact. Improve, mm. iterate, impact, right? Because anyone who takes it from me, if they actually take what I've said today and embrace it and go, okay, I'm going to go all out with this, you will fail at some point. What do you do? You get up and you get back on and you go again and you go again and you go again and you go again, right? And as you keep doing that, you will start to develop yourself to the next level. So what I'm saying is that one is about feeling confident internally. Two is actually doing something with it, with speaking and everything. And third is constantly focusing on how can I get better at this and how can I grow and develop and be better at it. Mm -hmm. So the three things that matter are uh, connecting with Allah and working yep. for Allah. The yep. number two is uh, speaking for Allah. And yep. number three is whenever things don't go perfect, this and that, you get back on it and you keep working on it. Yeah, with the, with the intention of Ihsan, because Allah deserves that we give him Ihsan, like we do something mm. to the best of our abilities with excellence mm. yeah. for Allah. So in order for you to do that, you're never going to do, like if you look at my number one YouTube video, the first video I ever made, it's never going to be as good as my 100th, yes. right? And that only comes through me making 100 videos. But oh. if I only make one, I'm not going to get Ihsan. So yeah. for you to get Ihsan, you just need to keep going, iterating, improving, impacting, iterating, mm. improving, impacting. Right, yeah. Uh Actually, the, you know the hadith, uh, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ uh, الْإِحْسَانِ I don't know what that means like from a kind of fiqhi point of view because it's like mm. Allah prescribed for everything ihsan. So yeah. does that mean it's far to do everything with ihsan? Mm. Um, that's quite a high bar. I don't yeah. know. No comment. <laughs> um, so you yeah, find but, out, let me know. Yeah, inshallah. <laughs> um, Actually, a side point that I wanted to share because I just thought it was so fascinating. I was listening to uh, Dr. Shadi uh, on the Safin Society podcast. They were talking about fear, okay? And very interesting point that uh, when Allah spoke to Musa on the um, mountain, okay? Uh, so Allah says, uh, Allah uh, turns his stick into... Uh, the snake, right? Is it snake? Yeah. Yes, yeah. The staff so a snake. Into, yes. snake. Yes. into a snake. Now, now uh, Musa's scared, right? He's shocked, he's scared, etc. Uh, what does Allah instruct him to do at that point? Do you know? Don't be scared? No, yeah, two things. One of them is don't be scared. Before What's that, he says one? something. He said, Allah says, Khudha wa la takhaf. Before not being scared, he says, take it, take the stick. Mm. So action removes fear. Mm, yes, exactly. Action removes fear. And yeah. uh, like the obvious thing would be to say, la takhaf khudha. Yeah, don't be scared, take it. But Allah said, no, Allah said, take it and don't be scared. So yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, and and you, know, you know what I mean? There's the converse to that as well. Uh -huh. So... If you don't take action on a fear, what happens? It grows. It grows, exactly. Yeah. Mm. And that, that's the thing that if you take the action immediately, mm. the fear will subside anyway. And then if you then say, you know, don't be scared, it's like, all right, now, now, okay, I won't be scared. Right. Yes. Yeah. But if you don't take action and someone says, don't be scared, you're like, but I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you're, like, you're, you're holding it for longer and longer and you're getting more and more scared. Yeah. So the time between the action uh, and letting the fear, basically, if you let the fear uh, breed without action, it'll just grow and grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So, bro, I wanted to wrap it up with this. I mean, maybe we can also talk about you, but I thought since we both know me and the audience obviously have heard me talk on these things, um, yeah. I thought let's kind of try and dissect like it's not well it's not because it's about me it's just because we both know it i thought it's interesting annie maybe um to think about like 
my confidence from when uh, we met to now, right? Yeah. And like, what what do you think? I feel like there's a big change, um, but I don't know uh, why or where exactly it came from. So I have some ideas, but like, what was your perception of my confidence when we first met? And that was probably five years ago. Yeah. So I think for me, like when, when I first spoke to you, because what I do is because I teach so much communication, I'm always analyzing people's communication. Mm. So when I first spoke to you, it wasn't in person, right? It was over a phone. Yeah. And I still remember the moment, actually, because I was in my back room right at the back. I was with Fessel. We were yeah. sitting on my nice new carpet and you were on speakerphone, yeah. right? Because we were both talking to you. And when I heard your voice, I was like, OK, this guy's got confidence. Right. So my perception just of your communication mm. was because you because this is a natural thing right when someone's articulate and someone can express themselves clearly mm. they come across as confident they give off the others uh, that that vibe that they're confident mm. right mm. and so when i first spoke to you um i didn't know your age i didn't know nothing about you right mm. all i knew was that you were a voice on the end of the other line yeah. so i thought your communication was very good uh, in my perception your confidence was very good uh, mm. and i think that um it was a very good level of confidence okay mm. um i think what's happened is as i got to know you deeper mm. i felt that your confidence was lower than what you were projecting out <laughs> yes <laughs> initially yes. right yeah. that just naturally and this is like like i said someone's very beautiful like people will think oh she's special right yeah, she's yeah. confident she's this right yeah. so in the same way i thought your communication because you were very well read mashallah that it was very high communication but when i got to know you yeah your confidence seemed lower than that mm, you got to right? know my doubts yeah i got to know your doubts i got to know <laughs> you deeper and everything right so yeah. i'm like his confidence is actually lower than what he projects out and in one way, that can be really positive because that means that you can punch above your weight and you can really get mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. But then on another level, it means that if someone gets to know you deeper, then they will know that there's actually a weakness there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So initially, that's what I found. Um, and I think that um, anyone who's going to kind of be around me at a partner level, I think I will challenge them differently to someone who I'm mentoring. Okay. So I remember there was this guy at work who was a mentor of mine and he said this thing one to me, I think it grew on to me. He goes, listen to me, Muhammad. He said that he was a non-Muslim who's mentoring me in, in, in my company. And he said, Muhammad, let me tell you something. Yeah. For the people who are on my level, who are around me, I expect a lot from them because they're on the same level as me. Mm -hmm. If someone is not on my level and they want help from me like you, I am 100% behind you and I will do anything to help you. Mm -hmm. Right. And I kind of took that mindset. I thought he was someone I looked up to. Right. And so for me, I'm like, if someone's on my level, like they in the same as me, like you're my partner, first my partner, I will have high standards for that person. Right. So I feel that um, a lot of the doubts and all these kind of things that you have or had, um, like, I think that we really kind of pounded on them and we really worked on them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, your level of confidence now is much higher. Right. And even mm -hmm. Fessel will tell you this, mashallah, that now, you know, the way you can just jump onto a, a camera and jump onto a call and speak and all that kind of stuff, like that's gone higher. But I think even your mindset has, has kind of risen, but that's after all that pounding, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's been pounded and it's been hit and all that kind of stuff. But now your confidence has grown. I think mm -hmm. some of that is to do with age. Some of that is to do with the people that you're around. Some of that is through natural growth and development. Mm -hmm. But I think that for your age, it's actually, actually at a very good level because most people I think at your age are probably still trying to figure it out a little bit, trying to figure out like what should my life be about and what should I do and, uh, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think alhamdulillah, it's like a, a very, very good level right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it can only increase from here, inshallah. Inshallah, yeah. You know, I, when I think about my confidence uh, growing up, like in school, I think uh, this is my, you know, self-analysis, right? That... I was actually quite uh, lacking confidence when I was mm -hmm. around that, like, let's say 15, 16 age, okay, which is quite yeah. a critical age. I was lacking confidence, especially compared to those around me, you know, friends. And I suppose that might have been, everyone was feeling, you know, lacking confidence, yeah. but we just yeah. don't notice it, right? Uh, on the outside, it doesn't seem like that. But you know what I think I did? I made up for it by building an ego. Right. Okay, what do you mean by that? What I meant by that was basically I learned that if I'm a bit arrogant, it will cover up for my lack of confidence. Mm. Okay. And I, I also uh, learned at that age, and maybe in a painful way, um, that uh, I have a weakness that I can become arrogant. Okay. I, I think I learned that at that age. And 
something must have had, I can't remember, but someone must have exposed my arrogance and it made me feel so bad, right? Like, damn, yes, I have to admit, uh, I am ag- arrogant, you know? So, but after that, you know, when I went uni and all this stuff, um, I think I kind of, I moved away from the whole ego thing, right? But it did teach me that I have that weakness, I think. Um, and then, you know, you know what built my confidence uh, after that, though? Like, legit confidence um, was being around new people and being in a new experience. Um, because what it allowed, because you know what it is, bro? A lot of the time, your, your confidence is purely based on context and what you uh, know about the world, okay? So when I first spoke to you, I was feeling very, it was a time uh, of my life where I was lacking confidence a lot, okay? And the, you know the reason I was lacking confidence is because I hadn't seen how incompetent the average person is. Mm. So because I was uh, naive, innocent to those things, I thought, damn, like I suck and everyone's great. But then when I get exposed to the real world and, and how the average person is in terms of work ethic or competence or whatever, yeah. then I realized, damn, like, I guess I don't suck that much. Like, look at these people. They're not trying or whatever. So that's really what was a game changer for me. Um, and that happened probably when I went uni. I was, I would say, uh, because it was like a special situation where very small classes in that uni and work ethic wise, I'm not going to say intelligence, but work ethic wise, I was a uh, top 10%, right? Mm. Just being bothered and just having like an attitude. And that wasn't because I'm special it's because those people were not bothered. Okay. And that must've helped me because I was getting uh, some of the best marks, people coming to me for help and all that helps, you know, all that definitely helps. Um, but you, I guess you do have the question of, you know, if you're in a class where no one's bothered and you start feeling good about yourself, should you be feeling good about yourself? You know, what, what do you think about that? Cause it, it definitely helped my, you know, my confidence, but you know. Yeah. I think, I think I had a similar situation when I came back from Pakistan and uh, I came to this country, um, you know, after some time there, mm. uh, I was way ahead of these guys. But again, a lot of it is like you said, where these guys just weren't really bothered and they didn't have the work ethic. And, and I think that that's very common. Um, I think, again, what I would say is that most of this stuff, if there's an empowering benefit that comes from it, and it's not haram, and it's not like something I'm yeah. saying a lot, anything like that, I yeah. think it's great. I think yeah. it's really good because as human beings, we need to take from our situations what we need to get to Jannah, right? Mm. That's the way we need to think about it, right? So if you realizing that, you know what, I've got a better work ethic than someone else, um, that helps your confidence, then I think you should. Right. Yes. Um, well, all I'm saying is that remember, it's like it's like they say it's like it's like having a scale, right? So, imagine you got a scale and it says, "I am confident, I am not confident." Mm-hmm. Every time you have a belief or a thought or something that or something happens, uh, like you know, let's imagine you stutter when you speak, that's a rock on "I am not confident," mm-hmm. and then another rock, and then another rock, till the point where it's weighed down and says, "I am not confident." Yeah. The way you're going to overcome that is by realizing actually, my work ethic's not that bad. I am confident. You know, mm. uh, my speaking is not so bad. I am confident. Mm-hmm. And so it's about those scales, right? Yeah. And so what we need to do is we need to, most of the time, I think, uh, find more ways to try and become confident, right? Because naturally, a lot of us are in our shell and we're not kind mm. of that mm. confident. All I'm saying is that if you link that confidence to Allah, for Allah, it actually makes it uh, much better and protects you from arrogance. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I think this is the case for a lot of people as well, maybe, is that my uh, journey of becoming more confident was ultimately just a journey of uh, being exposed to more people. It wasn't that I became more competent, right? Mm. I must have to a level, but it was just more like when, I don't know how, after how long um, uh, that we knew each other, you told me, oh, your communication skills are really good. Now, why did that have an impact on me? It's because uh, I know that you know a lot of people and you've spoken to a lot of people and you know about Mm -hmm. communication and you've trained people on communication. So when you said my communication skills are are good or decent, then that means something. Now, now, like that's weighty, right? And I think for me, it was like all just a journey of discovering the where I actually am in the scale, if you know what I mean. 
So yeah. before, uh, especially someone younger, your estimation of your competence is always low. It's always low. The only way your estimation of your competence goes up is by realizing how many people in the world there are that are actually lower than you. And that kind of lifts you up, if you know what I mean. But yeah. Because you, you don't get a clear image of where you are in the pecking order until you meet a lot of people and you experience a lot of you know, environments. I think that... There's, there's, there's also another element to it, which is like um, just realizing that what your, comp what your confidence is now it's no indication of where it'll be in the future what your competence is right now you have no idea what you're competent about like i always say this right like right now mm. um you know if you told me when i was low in confidence when i couldn't speak in front of people yeah. that i would go and train people on speaking and i would go into podcasts like this and talk about confidence i would think you are insane because right. i would not believe that i am capable of that mm. and so anyone watching this who's i would say under 30 they don't know what they're capable of fully. I, that's what I believe, mm. right? And I believe as you go and, but you see the capable and the potential thing is not a given. That's the problem, right? It's not that just because you have potential and just because you're capable, you will fulfill that potential. You will become capable. No, they it's not like, try, yeah. like you actually have to do the work for it, mm. right? Yes. And this is what I feel. I feel like the reason why a conference was developed is because I did so many different projects and I worked with so many different organizations. And I did so much. If I had done nothing, I would be at a different level of confidence. Yes. Do you think like someone who grew up in the same house as me can do what I do? No, they can't. Why? Mm. Because it's not just because they like, had the same father as me or something. It's because they didn't go off and do those things. So anyone watching mm. this now should realize that you should not be afraid to dream because mm. like whatever you want to dream, inshallah, you can achieve it. And you don't even need to worry about how you're going to achieve it because you can put it on Allah. Like get Allah's help to do it, right? Mm. But fundamentally, you need to know that you have so much potential. You are capable of so much, but you have to take the action. Like imagine mm. if you had stayed in uh, your country where you were rather than coming to the UK to study, right? How different would your life be if you went to a local university or something? Right, right. <laughs> like yeah. without having to live out, and this is what happens to a lot of people when they yes. go out and they live out, they yes. get more confident, they, they realize that they can actually fend for themselves and this and that. So, you know, you have to take the action, mm. you have to do that, and that's why it's, it's like it's really nice to watch these kind of podcasts and do this stuff. But ultimately, it's like when you switch this off, what are you going to do? And yes. so, it has to result in you going mm. and doing something different and doing mm. something bigger than yourself, mm. and then taking it in steps and working to that level where you can actually go and impact millions in Shona. Yeah. A action is the ultimate thing that builds confidence, right? Yeah. Like the right worldview and action, you know, basically. Yeah. Uh, do you like, I remember when I was like, you know, I would say much, you know, lower in, much lower in confidence. What I did was that exercise. You probably know it where you write down like things you can do or things you've done. And what, or I think most of us do is we keep quite a strong memory of the things we failed at or that we can't do. And we don't do the same for what we can do. And that naturally will mean, you know, our perception of our competence is, you know, low. So mm. I did that exercise only once. Um, but I would, I would say that that was a big, you know, kind of catapult forward because it's like evidence, you know, it's evidence. Beliefs are, are built upon pillars of evidence and, mm. Sometimes the, the evidence is weak only because you can't remember it. Yes. It's not exactly. because it's not there at all. It's because you can't remember it. So I would really, you know, recommend anyone tries that out. Definitely just write down anything you've accomplished. And I think I wrote even the silliest of things, to be honest. You know, I wrote that, oh, I can write an essay, you know, because yeah. I, I did it with the mindset that there are many people who can't do these things. So anything other than something that is default that any human can do, just write it. Breathing. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, apart from breathing. <laughs> so like breathing, I wouldn't put. Eating, yeah. I wouldn't put. Yeah. But for example, you could say fry an egg, right? It's very basic, but not mm. everyone can fry an egg, right? True. So put fry an egg. What you end up with is pages and pages of things you can do or you have done. And especially the things you have done, a specific thing you've done um, uh, is very powerful, man. And yeah, sometimes it's most of the time, maybe it's all about just how you think of yourself rather than uh, yeah. what you actually can do. Because most of us, alhamdulillah, you know, can do plenty uh, or have done plenty. Um, what about yourself, bro? Like, because you're older than me. So I'm just interested. So me looking forward now, what can I expect in terms of 
could I expect a lot of growth further in confidence or maybe can my confidence get shattered still at this age? Like, you know, how does it work, you know, when you're a little bit older yeah. than I am? Yeah, I think what happens is that you kind of go through phases, like you said, right? Um, one thing is that if you keep, what I would say is that you need to keep growth uh, at the forefront of your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was at IERA, you know, I was head of operations and, you know, the whole uh, next step up for me would be CEO, right? Um, for me as CEO, I felt like as operations manager, like I had done everything I would have done at CEO. Right. And so for me, at that point, I prioritize what's most important to me is my own growth and development. And so I decided to get into entrepreneurship and business. And that was amazing because when I got out of that role, I era, I said to myself, I'm so developed now. Why am I so developed? I've done, I've produced DVDs, I've trained speakers, I've made videos, I've directed adverts, I've done this, I've created websites, I've done everything. I'm so developed, right? Mm. Like <laughs> anything I'm going to do, I'm going to be amazing at. Yeah. And you know, when I hit entrepreneurship, it was like, pow, right? Mm. Because it challenged you and tests you because now you're dealing with emotions. I went from, you know, having a paycheck every single uh, month of my life for 10 years or whatever it was mm. to suddenly like this month, I've got no money. It's all about me trying to make that money, mm. you know? Um, so it's a completely different shift. So I think as, as you kind of uh, keep challenging yourself in different ways, what you'll find is that your, your growth will go to the next level, but your confidence, it will keep getting hit. Right, mm. it keeps taking a beating. Why? Because as you're growing more, you're getting out of your comfort zone, and every time you're out of your comfort zone, your confidence diminishes, yes. and then you have to grow more, and then your confidence has to increase again. Mm. So, you're constantly going through this thing where it's like dipping, yeah. but generally, the trend is upwards, yeah. and your confidence is much higher than anyone else mm. ever would as be. Long anyway. as you're growing, though, yeah, but yeah, as long as you're growing, it's always going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to go up, it's going to go down. But you just need to make sure that it's generally moving in a higher level, and this is the same way I would, I would look at people. Uh, in terms of their iman, right? Like when you first start practicing, you know, your iman is high and then it dips. And then you, your job is to get it high and high and high and make sure that your lowest level is at a very high level. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, so I see your confidence being the same way. You know, you're going to get really good at stuff. You're going to become more confident. You're going to feel like you know it and you're certain, right? It's going to yeah. tip to overconfidence and then you take a beating and yeah. then it's like, oh my God, I, I'm not that great right yes. it's like yeah. that whole day day in the life of an entrepreneur right yeah. this is up and down <laughs> yeah. and so i think the confidence is like that but i think the thing i would advise people to be careful about as they get older it's very natural for people to fall into arrogance as they get older right mm. because you just become more set in your ways and you're kind of like okay i know it all now type of thing and you know life is quite kind of predictable and then allah's giving you more blessings so you're more comfortable and so arrogance becomes quite quite normal and that's why you see these grumpy old men as they call them right people who are arrogant stuck in their ways don't want to listen to anyone they've got their way and that's it mm. and so i think those are the things to kind of uh, keep in mind because the last thing you want to do is is get older and and have all that wisdom and then become arrogant because that will destroy it all like mm. arrogance is one of those things where like shaitan he knew more about allah than the pi most pious person here right? And he, he worshipped Allah in a way that, you know, most of us never will. And so all of that, but the arrogance just destroyed it all. Um, and so we could, like we said, it's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. And mm. that's why if you put Allah at the forefront of it, inshallah, you like just keep it as humility and, and believers confidence rather than arrogance. Yeah, yeah. So, so going, going back to any competence you have, it's all about remembering that competence is just from Allah. Exactly. Allah gave you that exactly. competence. Allah yes. allowed you to do that. And yes. ultimately, the com competence must be used for something good that pleases Allah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I guess, inshallah, being uh, a, a, a parent and being in business is a good place to be for growth. Yeah, definitely. Because <laughs> you're kind of forced to grow. Yeah. Uh, if you don't grow, you basically have given up. There's no other way, yeah. is there? There's and if no you're way. ever lacking, bro, if you're ever lacking in things, Give me one call. I'll introduce you to my family. You can come and do all the family mediation that happens in our families, inshallah. That will take your growth to another level as well. Yes, that will humble <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. Bro, Jazakallah khairan. This has been a really fascinating uh, conversation. Yeah, it's been great. Inshallah, I didn't speak too much and, and you gave us everything, uh, you know, shared all of your experience. Um, what do you want to say to end it, bro? Do you want to uh, mention anywhere people can go to learn more? Uh, and just final thoughts and stuff. Yeah, sure. I just want to say that uh, I have a free training that I offer at muslimmastery.com slash confidence. 
uh, MuslimMastery.com slash confidence. And that will just give you like an introduction. It's got talks about the lies uh, to do with confidence, a lot of the stuff that we discussed here and everything. Um, I think for me, what I would just say fundamentally to people is that um, when it comes down to it, um, I would advise that you take your paradigm and you throw it in the bin. The way you look at the world, the way you look at things, throw that in the bin. Accept the only truth of your reality, which is the reality that Allah has given us. Make that your paradigm. And I feel that you would be empowered and confident to a whole nother level. And then to take that and basically go and impact the world and impact your own akhirah. Jazakallah khairan Muhammad. That's a really good way to end it. Um, so and i'll put the link for the uh, training in the description inshallah as well and, Great. Uh, yeah. uh thanks bro for everything and uh this will be a really good episode to plow inshallah uh sure. having said that subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh